Good morning, everyone. Oh, we'll try that again. Good morning, everyone. There we go. Wonderful. Uh, my name is Katie Cosimonel, and I'm really grateful to have the chance to be here today. Uh, this conversation is so deeply important to me in um, the work that I do as a proud uh, uh, member of, of rural America, child of rural America, um, who conducts research on, on maternity care and maternal health policy and rural communities. This is you know, coming together of a lot of issues that I care about. And I'm so grateful that today we are centering the voices of rural residents and rural families, really thinking about what life is like the good, the challenging, the joyful, the difficult. And um, t centering around that as we move forward, thinking about how to improve the way that people give birth and the bring all uh, rural babies off to the best possible start in life. So I, just a quick reminder of the overall meeting objectives today. I have the uh, privilege and honor of moderating this panel and also of setting the stage for what we are uh, about to do and what the conversation we are about to engage in today. This session is going to start with an introduction that I will briefly give, talking about who gives birth in rural communities and who takes care of those folks, just to give us all the kind of broad demographics of who we're talking about, and again, centering us on, on those folks and their lives. And then we have an absolutely fantastic panel here of, uh, of my colleagues, uh, Dr. Wanda Barfield, Dr. Payin Hung, and Dr. Alina Salganikov. At the end, if we have time, I understand we are going to keep ourselves on time, and I'm committed to doing that as the moderator, um, we can talk a little bit about what we know, what we don't know, and what we should do. And I hope that those questions take us throughout the day today. There we go. So we're going to start with some rural demographics. Who lives and who gives birth in rural communities? You may have heard that... Oh boy, my buttons. There we go. Uh, that rural America is older, poorer, sicker, and whiter than the rest of America, um, than urban places. And that's true uh, overall, that we, we hear that a lot. Um, but not everyone in rural America is old, poor, white, and sick. Um, in fact, uh, there are a lot of folks that represent different demographics. Um, rural America is diverse. One in five rural residents is a person of color or an indigenous person, and those that give birth are particularly diverse. In the United States as a whole, 52% of people who give birth identify as white. 48% of people who give birth are not white people. Um, and the, those statistics are a little bit less in rural communities, but it's still a very, very diverse population of folks. Rural America is not a monolith. However, there are some common challenges that rural residents face in um, creating health and in accessing health care and in um, just uh, going about living a flourishing and vibrant life. I must be pressing this a little bit too slow or too softly. I'll do my, oh, 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 wow, okay. <laughs> I'm getting good at the technology. Uh, <laughs> so I wanted to present this map from one of our most recent um, policy briefs at the University of Minnesota Rural Health Research Center that I direct. Uh, this is the county level racial and ethnic composition of um, rural uh, counties in the United States. And what you can see here is counties are just mapped by their um, majority racial and ethnic uh, uh, makeup. What you can see here is the, that rural America is a diverse place. If you look at the, the color that's kind of a light purple, those are counties that are majority uh, Latino. And in the um, counties that are, that are red colored, the majority population is non-Hispanic black. In the counties that are this deep blue, um, you have a majority of residents being American Indian or Alaska Native. This is rural America. This is rural America. And we often hear about the deaths of despair in rural America. And frequently, that dialogue, as we bring together and think about the multiple layers of vulnerability and of resilience in rural communities, when we talk about deaths of despair, much of the dialogue focuses on middle-aged white men who have experienced really um, dramatic rises in rates of, of um, death, of suicide, of drug overdose. But when we take a step back and look at the rural counties, the counties with the highest premature death rates occur are in counties where the majority of residents are American Indian or Alaska Native or uh, non-Hispanic Black. So 
while we pay attention to dramatic rises, we cannot lose sight of the diversity of rural America and of thinking about important ways to address uh, the health of all rural Americans. Now a little bit more information about rural women. So there are 18 million reproductive age women that live in non-metropolitan U.S. counties. They are 82% white, um, about 52% have a high school education or less. It is important that we remember these demographics when we are thinking about programming, clinical, and policy interventions to support this population. 12.1% um, have no health insurance. And we heard today, health insurance is not the be all end all, but it's certainly important to facilitate financial access to care. Medicaid is a really important payer, and we're gonna see that in a moment. 18.9% um, are at or below the federal poverty level. And um, about 5% have a family income of less than $10,000 a year. 37.6% are less than 40,000. And we have only about 6.5% of folks that have a family income over $150,000 a year. So this is what reproductive age uh, folks look like in rural America. How about oh, a little bit more information about that here? You can see these charts are from the National Survey of Family Growth, and they just show some rural and urban differences that are important. The average age at first sex is younger for rural folks compared with urban folks, and there's a higher percentage of women living in rural areas that have at least one birth, and the, the sort of overall numbers of births are higher. So these are important to factor in when we're talking about birth in rural communities. We're more frequently talking about birth for a mother who already has children at home. And what does that mean for her access to services and the quality of care that she receives? So a little bit more on rural births themselves. And a lot of these findings come from my own research. Each bullet point is like a paper. So if you want to talk more about it at some point, I'm happy to. About 15% of all births occur in rural hospitals. About 75% of rural residents give birth at rural hospitals. 25% give birth at urban hospitals. That um, is a, a helpful overview of um, what we often expect to see, which is referral patterns of higher acuity births uh, going to urban tertiary care centers, but there's variation by payer, and that's important. So controlling for people with the exact same clinical conditions, Medicaid beneficiaries are more likely to give birth at rural hospitals, even when they have clinical, com clinical complications. And Medicaid here is, is more of an indicator of lower income folks as opposed to like the, the benefits that are associated with Medicaid itself. Also, about 6% of rural births are preterm, and those are births that should probably be occurring in a hospital that has a neonatal intensive care unit. Of those, only 40% actually occurred at a hospital with a NICU. And folks that are Medicaid beneficiaries, folks that are non-Hispanic black, and folks that are teen moms that are living in rural areas, rural residents, are less likely to deliver their preterm babies at a hospital with a NICU. Also, I want to highlight the uh, importance of the opioid epidemic that was mentioned earlier by Kellyanne Conway in her comments. We know that there's been a rising rate of opioid-affected births and um, that that increase has been faster and, and the overall effect has been higher in rural areas compared with urban. Um, of rural residents with opioid-affected births, about 60% of those folks, these are, op these are diagnosed opioid-affected births, about 60% of them are occurring at rural hospitals. 50% of opioid-affected births that are preterm are occurring in rural hospitals. It is not enough to focus on the large urban tertiary care facilities because those births are happening in our rural communities. They are happening in hospitals that provide obstetric services and they're happening in hospitals that have stopped providing that service or don't have that service. So how do we deal with that in communities to make sure that everyone has the best chance at a healthy birth and uh, um, uh, a safe birth? So who takes care of rural moms? Who takes care of folks that, that give birth in rural areas? Again, I'm going to briefly go over uh, um, findings from our overall research in this space. Most of these findings are taken from a survey that we conducted between November of 2013 and March of 2014 of all 306 rural hospitals in the nine states that are highlighted here. And we surveyed all those hospitals. I'm proud to say we got an 86% response rate, which was fantastic. Folks were really interested in talking with us about this. It's really important to rural hospitals to take good care of the moms in their communities. So here's what we found out. 
If we look at the average number, so this is just the number of humans, the number of, of physicians that are attending births by birth volume, by hospital birth volume, among all the rural hospitals that we talked to, there were about a little over three uh, obstetricians per hospital and a, a little over four uh, family physicians per hospital. This varies dramatically by birth volume. You can see the role that family physicians play, the enormous, important, and central role of family physicians in attending births in rural hospitals, particularly those with um, fewer than uh, about 460 births a year. Those that are higher have a have a obstetricians play a more important or a, are more frequent providers of, of birth services. We also want to look at the at um, other types of clinicians, including nurse staffing. This is a really just a quick snapshot of looking at rural hospitals with fewer than 300 births a year have a much higher percentage of uh, nursing nursing that is um, shared across different units, as opposed to dedicated nurse staffing on labor and delivery and postpartum. When we are thinking about interventions to support birth, and we need to think about the fact that in the uh, almost half of all rural hospitals that do births the nursing staff is shared across labor and delivery they are not dedicated only to that unit and so that has important implications and finally i want to highlight the role of midwifery in rural hospitals about a third of all rural hospitals that provide obstetric services have midwives delivering uh, babies and midwives um, frequently practice alongside obstetricians in, in about 86% of the places where they, uh, rural places where they attend deliveries. And they work with family physicians in almost half of the rural hospitals where they, where they attend deliveries. So thinking about interprofessional collaboration is extremely important as well. Now we get to challenges. I'm told I have 30 seconds left, so I'm going to get through these. These are, these are things that are known, right? Um, scheduling is a challenge. Training is a challenge. Getting folks the training that they need to take care of births. Recruitment and retention of clinicians and census fluctuation, ups and downs of different birth volume from day to day in rural hospitals, and as well as intra-hospital relationships across different units. Labor and delivery can be in conflict with um, resources that may be invested in um, the emergency department or cardiac care or um, other, other types of service lines. So this is just a summary of findings on workforce. I'm not going to belabor these points because I want to move on to our other panelists. And these were our highlight points from um, what, I re what I just presented. I think what we want to focus on today is the goal for rural communities, workable solutions to the challenges that rural communities face to ensure maternity care access and quality for all rural people, recognizing the diversity and the vitality of rural people and rural communities. So I want to thank the um, Federal Office of Rural Health Policy that's funded our research center to do much of the research that, we, that I presented today. And I want to move on to our panel presentations. I believe our, oh, thank you. <laughs> that was a lot of information very fast. I am now going to pass the microphone along to Dr. Wanda Barfield, who's going to talk with us a little bit from her perspective. Thank you, Katie. Um, so I'm wearing a uniform because I'm in the U.S. Public Health Service, but before being in the Public Health Service, I was in the U.S. Army as a neonatologist. And so I'm very familiar with the issues affecting rural populations for the military because many are stationed in more remote areas. And it was really important for me as, uh, as I worked at Walter Reed and other major medical centers to make sure that I equipped obstetricians and pediatricians for rural settings in terms of being prepared for those issues that may happen when, where resources are limited. So what I'd like to do is just, first of all, thank Kara James for this opportunity to be here and also talk with you a bit about some of the national data on maternal morbidity and mortality and health disparities in the United States. So what we know is that some 46 million Americans, at least 15% of the U.S. population, currently live in rural areas. And CDC data shows that they're more likely to die from these five leading causes of death as compared to urban Americans. And that's heart disease, cancer, unintentional injury, chronic lower respiratory disease, and stroke. What we also know, 
is that in rural populations, they're less likely to have insurance or access to health care. We also know that there are issues with regard to higher rates of smoking, high blood pressure, and unintentional injury, as well as a host of other conditions. So given that, that there may be this additional disadvantage, we have to think about how these factors in a larger scheme affect maternal and infant health. So one specific example that we know in terms of data is the disparities that we're seeing in rural and urban areas in the U.S. And we know that for rural areas, infants have a higher likelihood of dying as compared to large urban areas. And so this is really a factor that's contributing. And it's important to note that maternal health and infant health are very closely linked. So although we are still challenged currently in terms of having more of a deeper dive of maternal mortality in rural areas, we do understand that we're seeing these issues with higher risks for infants in rural areas. And from this data from 2014, in rural counties we see an infant mortality rate of 6.55 per thousand, which is 6% higher than small and medium um, urban counties, and it's 20% higher than in urban counties. We also know that maternal mortality rates have been rising, or at least have not been decreasing compared to other developed areas. And this is really a big issue uh, that we really want to try to address as well as discuss here. We know that there are about 700 women who die each year from pregnancy-related causes. And our division, CDC's Division of Reproductive Health, is really committed to trying to address these issues and are now working very closely with states to understand um, these contributing factors. We also know that African American and Native Alaskan women are over three times more likely to die from pregnancy-related complications than white women, and I think as Katie has alluded to, that's both urban and rural settings. And we also know that about 66% of these deaths may be preventable, but we need more data in order to really understand how we can intervene. So this is just looking at uh, pregnancy-related um, maternal mortality by race, ethnicity, and age through what's called the Pregnancy Mortality Surveillance System. And what you can see here is even by age, there are differences with regard to um, pregnancy mortality, but you can also see that there are differences with regard to race ethnicity. And so that's important even in, when we're thinking about both urban and rural settings to see that these uh, disparities still exist. And when we look at race, uh, ethnicity, and education, what you can see here is that there are still striking disparities so that whether it's less than high school, completed high school, or some college education, that there are differences that we're seeing between white, African American, and Native American mothers. This is just a slide that shows the incredible variation by states, and we don't have each specific state uh, named out here due to confidentiality, but you can see that there are huge differences in pregnancy-related mortality by uh, states and Washington, D.C. So how can we work toward preventing maternal deaths? We, we need to better understand these causes by using robust data. And at CDC, we're really trying to disentangle some of these issues in terms of causes. And then we also need to improve access to quality care in order to try to make a difference. And, it's, and this is not just in the hospital, but care throughout a woman's life course. So what is it that we really need to know? So I think with regard to some of the factors, we really need to understand what are the factors that contribute to deaths in rural settings. And are those factors different in urban settings? What are also the important interventions that we need to prevent deaths? And how can we, again, in an army, like in my experience in the Army, we have to think about interventions that may be different and how we can be prepared. What are those tools that are need to 
inform the prevention efforts? And then lastly, what are the measures that we need in order to monitor our progress? So what is CDC doing to get better data? The first is trying to make sure that we're working with states to identify specific causes of death through maternal mortality review committees. These are groups of individuals at the local level who work together bringing all of their skill sets so that we can really think about ways to prevent maternal mortality. Review to action is a recent work that we did at CDC, and we'll make sure that at the back of the room there's some materials for you to look at. But this is the opportunity that we had through the CDC Foundation and Merck for Mothers to look at specific issues that affected states. And we're really learning a lot about what are some of the related causes. Maria is the Maternal Mortality Review Information Application. And what that is, is a, it's a common language so that we have an opportunity to really compare the risks of pregnancy-associated deaths across jurisdiction so that we can speak with the same language. Although this is an important issue, the numbers of maternal deaths are still relatively infrequent, so we need to think about a uniform way of talking about this. We also think we need to improve quality so that the National Network of Perinatal Quality Collaboratives is a way that clinical experts can come together with public health and think about those interventions that need to be done to prevent these deaths in the future, as well as locate. So I've done a lot of work on risk of appropriate care for infants, but increasingly we're we understand, and many thanks to ACOG and the Society for Maternal Fetal Medicine, thinking about the places that women need to deliver based on their risk. So being at the right place at the right time is critically important in order for us to prevent these um, unnecessary deaths. So this is what better data can do. And this is data from these 14 states or jurisdictions that look at maternal mortality. And this is by race, at least for non-Hispanic black and non-Hispanic white women. And what we're seeing is that for non-Hispanic black women, there are higher rates of death due to cardiovascular conditions, due to issues related to infection, cardiomyopathy. But for non-Hispanic white women, what we're seeing are higher risks of death due to mental health conditions um, and hemorrhage. So we need to think about what are some of the issues because these strategies may be different. And this is really uh, just an illustration of putting the pieces together. There are so many federal activities that are going on across that we need to really work together. So this is you know, the Alliance for um, Innovation in Maternal Care that's supported by HRSA and ACOG, Perinatal Quality Collaboratives, Maternal Mortality Review Committees. All of these pieces need to work together so that we're able to collectively address these issues. This is just an example of work that's going on in Utah and Wyoming, and this is Project ECHO, which is an opportunity to use telehealth, telemedicine, to try to identify issues with regard to risks for maternal mortality and uh, severe maternal morbidity. So the, the la just in conclusion, I want to say, you know, we have an opportunity to really work together to try to reduce these headlines, right, these, these compelling stories of women who are dying at an untimely way shortly after their birth or during pregnancy. And the only way that we can really do this is taking these stories and thinking about them systematically so that we can understand why these women died, what were the interventions that needed to be done to prevent them. And, I, you know, I'm really thankful for this opportunity for us to come together and really try to think about this. So if you need more information, you can go to our website. There are many tools and resources that are available um, in trying to address this issue. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Barfield. I really appreciate your final 
point that you made about um, taking the stories together and understanding the patterns and then um, using that information to change the stories. Our next speaker is Dr. Peiyan Hung, who is going to um, speak with us about uh, closures and access in rural, uh, rural America. Thank you, Katie. Um, it's such a pleasure to stand up here and sharing this, um, some, some research findings we have on this important topic. Um, um, I would like to talk to you about the access to hospital-based obstetric care units in rural America. Here we go. Okay. So in the following 10 minutes, I'm going to share with you what we found in the in declining trend of hospital obstetric units in nationwide, and why some of the rural hospitals are closing their obstetric units, and where these closures are, which communities are hurt the most across all rural communities in the United States. And then I will conclude with the relationship of how these hospital obstetric unit closures affect the travel burdens and specialized disability to hospital <coughs> obstetric care. So we, before we get into those topics, I would like to say a word of thanks to my colleagues and mentors at the University of Minnesota and University of South Carolina. Majority of the work that I'm sharing with you today is funded and supported by the Federal Office of um, Rural Health Policy and we appreciate their continuous uh, support for this important work. So the hospital obstetric unit closures have been a pressing concern in, in rural communities and across the, the states. And we know childbirth is the top, the most common reason for hospitalizations. We pay 27 billion every year for childbirth hospitalizations and over half over, as uh, Katie said, over half a million of babies were born in rural healthcare settings. But declining in access to hospital obstetric services really have detrimental effects, as we show in a, in a lot of literature. There will be uh, adverse maternal and birth outcomes associated with the loss of in county hospital obstetric units. And we also found. Um, in a lot of evidence show that travel burdens to hospital obstetric care may increase mater maternal health stress and that leads to postpartum depression or other postpartum de uh, hemorrhage associated with prolonged labor. So we found that it's universal, but there is a much devastating decrease in trend in rural non-core areas. Hospitals in this, uh, this less populated communities are more likely to, this, to close the obstetric units. The data points stops at 2013 here. While we also see anecdotal evidence more and more stories in the business letters, in the stories, case studies, in news are emerging to tell us there are more and more hospitals in rural areas are closing. Especially their health systems are uh, decide to close out because of all the provider consolidations. Timely, timely access to hospital obstetric care is essential, especially there is a growing complexity of maternal clinical conditions and pregnancy complications. So why these rural hospitals are closing? We found that difficulties in staffing issues, as Katie pointed out, is the top reason why these rural hospitals are closing their units. And other frequently cited reasons include, include low birth volume. Some rural hospitals don't even have one birth in a month to maintain their obstetric units. And there is a balance between access and outcomes that we have to talk about regarding the low birth volume. But there are other, other reasons in terms of low reimbursements. A lot of rural hospitals heavily relied on Medicaid um, covered births. And Medicaid really paid about half of the reimbursements as much as the reimbursement paid by private insurance. 
and that will lead <coughs> to the financial dis difficulties adding up to the rural hospitals facing negative operating margins. These rural hospitals in the low resources and low infrastructure areas. They don't afford the surgical and anesthesia coverage to operate um, the high risk pregnancy. And the cost to operate obstetric services is really high. Whenever a rural hospitals they face financial distress, they don't really um, they will cut the unprofitable services and always, and oftentimes, obstetric units is one of them. So where are these closures look at it? When we look at the counties, rural counties that had, that had the hospital obstetric unit closures, we were struck, we were struck, this is striking to see in 2004, there were 45 percent uh, of rural counties did not have hospital obstetric unit to begin with, and additional nine percent of rural counties experienced loss of all the hospital obstetric units during 2004 to 2014. And you can see here, you can see there are some clusters of rural counties that did not have obstetric unit. In hospital obstetric units in 2014, and their neighboring counties experienced the foreclosures. And those are the areas that access issues are exacerbated due to these closures. When we look at, we want to, so I'm going to share with you two main messages we found in this paper that there are some communities that are disproportionately affected by these hospital obstetric unit closures. And we found that, of course, all rural counties, counties that have higher proportion of non-Hispanic black reproductive age women were, have higher odds of experiencing the foreclosures. And this odds ratio is pretty high and striking, as we know from Dr. Rafael and from Dr. Cosmanio about the disadvantage and their vulnerability in terms of maternal mobility and maternal, maternal mortality facing uh, African-American women. But there are some other findings we, I want to share with you. In counties that have one additional ob per capita and one additional family physician per capita, would it be associated with lower odds of experiencing the loss of in-county hospital obstetric units? And there are other uh, bipartisan legislations are solving this and distributing maternal care providers to the to the underserved rural areas. So we're it's kind of promising, and we we are, we are hopefully that they will be effective. So so far, I've been sharing with you on the county level and access and the the incidence of hospital obstetric services. How far, really, these rural mothers have to travel to reach the nearest hospital with obstetric units, with obstetric capacity for their childbirth. We found that when we check, so the same, we include all the hospital discharge data, include 100% hospital discharge data of all these nice days that the same as um, Katie presented for the survey. And, and then take into account all the hospitals providing obstetric unit have obstetric units in the adjacent states, not only in state but also hospitals in the adjacent states. So that frontier women would have to reach to the, their nearest hospital with obstetric units. So we include over six hundred thousand maternal childbirth hospitalizations in each year and calculate how far they have to travel to reach the nearest hospital really had obstetric units. I'm going to share with you the average driving distance in miles to the nearest hospital obstetric services. And when those women did not experience the loss of hospital obstetric services in, in their nearest one, the average did not change between 2002 and 2013. Again, the exposure here is for those mothers that experienced the loss of hospital obstetric services in their nearest one during 2003 to 2013. But what happened 
when rural mothers experience the loss of their hospital, the nearest hospital obstetric unit, the, the distance, driving distance in rural, assuming they have, they have the car to drive, and it's doubled, the miles is doubled. When you see the average about 30 in 2013, that is the average, and that miles can be the mountain roads, can be very, very slippery road in winter. So, in conclusion, good, um, we, we learned that what we know is rural, <coughs> rural hospitals face difficulties in operating up obstetric illness because of low birth volume, staffing concerns, and all other community factors that may, that may influence their capacity and their decision to operate. There are other concerns that due to disclosures because of because of the pre -net, local prenatal care and the distant intrapartum care or labor delivery care in the distant hospitals. So we have to think about how to balance this and then really advance and improve the continuity of maternity care in the spectrum. Again, I will conclude with the driving distance that will increase and substantially for rural mothers, rural mothers facing the loss of hospital obstetric illness. And this concludes my presentation. We will talk about what we have to know in the um, following at later. Thank you, and I welcome any questions you may have later. Thanks. Thank you so much, Peyin, Dr. Hung. Uh, Peyin was a graduate student who worked with me, and so it's so cool to call her Dr. Hung up here. It was, it's awesome. Thank you for your work. Um, Dr. Alina Salganikov is going to come next and talk to, about women's health more generally in rural communities. Thank you so much. It's uh, really an honor to be here with such a distinguished panel, and thank you, Dr. James, for including me today. Um, I'm just going to start with a caveat right now. I am not an expert on rural health, um, and, um, but I know a, kind of an awful lot about coverage and women's health. So I'm going to kind of put some of that in context. Um, we have been talking, we've got a lot of statistics and information, and um, I'm going to try to kind of cruise through some of it so that we're not really redundant today. I think we. Um, had really some really terrific overviews on some of the key statistics, but I really want to drill down on coverage because coverage matters. It matters to women before they get pregnant, while they're pregnant, and after they're pregnant, and where they live really shapes that coverage. So what I'm going to just quickly talk about is how we kind of finance and pay for maternity care for uh, women in rural communities, talk a little bit about private insurance, and then spend a little more time talking about Medicaid because we really heard earlier today about the important role of Medicaid um, in financing maternity care. And then I want to talk a little bit about kind of some opportunities, and some of it will become obvious as I present some of my points around how we can strengthen and improve coverage and scope of service for rural and low-income women. Um, so this is from uh, a paper that Kara, Dr. Kara James presented, and I think that we've done a lot of looking at kind of the different counties and um, you know where women live, but a lot of what happens is uh, the region and the state in particular really makes a huge difference. So um, I did, um, and Kendall, are you back there? <laughs> um, we did some uh, quick analysis looking at um, the states across the country and where the majority of women um, rural women live. And you can see here that in some of the frontier states in particular, we have mm -hmm. very high rural penetration. But the, where the states are, um, the, the actual states and the number of women in rural communities really differs. So I think that it's important to keep yeah. in balance that as some of the states, even though we don't think of them as necessarily rural states, have high numbers of women who are living in rural communities. But it's also important to really look and really drill down and we can see that these national averages and the state average really mask some of the diversity within the rural communities. And this here shows um, along the bottom half of our uh, country that women who live in rural communities in the south, in the west, in Alaska, and in Hawaii really are dispropor disproportionately, they have higher rates of uh, women of color 
But if you look here, these are very consistent with some of the prior slides that we saw, but in the states in the south, higher share of black women who live in rural areas, and in the southwest and in the northwest as well, um, you have higher shares of uh, Latina, Hispanic women living in those states. I want to say that this, uh, we did, I did a very kind of quick analysis for this presentation and really I just want to recognize that, you know, in some of the frontier states and in Oklahoma we have higher shares of native women in Hawaii, um, much higher, actually a majority of the rural population is Hawaiian um, native and in Alaska, Alaska native. So I just want to acknowledge that even though the sample sizes were too small. So let's get to maternity coverage. Um, the majority of women of reproductive age are covered by private insurance. And so we have um, either they get it either through their employer or through their spouse's employer, or they buy it um, a per individually per purchased plan, either through a state-based exchange or through a private broker. Um, the ACA made some really important uh, changes to really strengthen maternity care. Pregnancy can no longer be defined as a pre-existing condition. Um, that's, that's pretty huge because in the past it was a pre-existing condition and if you wanted maternity coverage you had to pay extra for a rider. That's no longer the case. Maternity care is now an essential health benefit along with newborn care and preventive care. And now prenatal care and screening services, breastfeeding support, postpartum depression screening are all now covered in most private plans. That is a really important improvement. But it's important to note, before I kind of move on to some other issues, that many women who have private insurance are in high deductible plans. So they have to pay a lot of money out of pocket. So even though they may have insurance and have first dollar coverage for some of their prenatal care, they leave the hospital with debt. And in many cases, it's very significant. So just that's an important way that we can also strengthen that because that's um, something that they have to live with. It's also important to look at the differences. You know, we've been talking a lot about diversity and I think that it's, we can't make this point enough. When we look at the, the burden of maternal mortality and maternal morbidity, this burden really falls much higher on women of color. And you can see here that while private insurance is important for all women, that for African American women and Hispanic women, Medicaid plays a critical role. But I also want to point you to the high rates of uninsurance among Hispanic women and also significant rates among African American women. So I'm going to now switch to Medicaid. Um, Medicaid plays a critically important role for women throughout their reproductive lives. It covers family planning services without cost sharing, um, and um, this actually it has a 90% match really to really incentivize states from offering family planning services. Half of the states also have a family planning waiver program that offers really critical uh, coverage actually for women postpartum who lose their Medicaid coverage. Um, it covers pregnancy related care, again, without premiums, without cost sharing. That is critically important for low income women. But there is a wide variation in the benefits because the states get to set the benefits and they get to set the reimbursement rates. So when we were talking about the low rates, that is not a uniform national issue and there's a lot of variation, but it really, it's up to the state to set that. So there, you know, state policymakers can really make a difference in shaping payment policy. And also Medicaid covers postpartum coverage, but it only covers up to 60 days postpartum. So after that period, and Allison, Dr. Allison Stubig has talked about this as the fourth trimester and also made the analogy like sometimes we treat women like candy wrappers, like we have the baby and then afterwards we don't really do a whole lot to keep women healthy. So it's really important to keep our eye on the postpartum period. So part of this challenge that we have right now is that many women lose coverage in postpartum. And these, if you look here on the bottom half, these are many of the states where we have a lot of women living in rural communities. These are states that have not yet adopted, I say yet because I, um, that may still happen, uh, have not adopted a Medicaid expansion. 
So when we think about what that means, Medicaid eligibility for pregnant women is considerably higher than it is for other parent groups. So the, now the floor in states that have expanded Medicaid is 138% of the poverty rate. It's a little higher in DC, I'm just giving a shout out here, it's 215% for parents. Of two minutes, I'm gonna talk really fast. Um, and so you can see here the floor, but in states that haven't expanded Medicaid, I want you to look at the difference. So women after um, postpartum period, they have to qualify. In Texas, you need to make, uh, for a family of three, under $4,000 for you to qualify for Medicaid. Those women do not qualify for federal subsidies under the health exchange, and they do not qualify for Medicaid. So that, you know, when we want to talk about strengthening coverage, strengthening care postpartum and interpartum um, is really going to be a, a, an important issue. And this is actually from the PRAMS data that the CDC has, and you can see here in two states the comparison in Texas that has an expanded Medicaid, and I just want to point you to the Medicaid bar, which is the middle bar, which is light blue, um, and you can see during pregnancy it goes up to 47%, and then postpartum it drops to 14%, but the uninsured rate goes from 2%, so most, most births are paid for, is that 3%? 3%, and then goes up to 37%. In Ohio, which also has this large rural population, you can see that pre-pregnancy rates are quite low. The Medicaid, um, the pre-pregnancy uninsured rates is lower, and then even after postpartum, the Medicaid rates stay high, and the postpartum uninsured rate is still quite low. So the other point that I want to make, and I have 30 seconds, so I'm going to talk really fast because I'm from Philadelphia. Um, <laughs> and so um, you can see here that there is tremendous variation across the states in terms of the scope of services that are covered. We can't just assume that because the state says that they cover maternity care, that they cover the full range of maternity benefits. Um, and also there's quite a significant variation in postpartum care, and we talk about the availability of services. This is from, um, uh, this is a contraceptive desert map from the uh, Power to Decide, and you can see here the states that are, the counties that are red, or in the lighter colors are counties that where women cannot get the full range of contraceptive options. You can see also as well that the states really not, don't all cover the full range of services that we all are agreed upon are really important for high quality maternity care in the postpartum period. So with that, I'm gonna wrap it up and just really um, welcome comments and questions afterwards, so thank you. Thank you all very much. I um, want to check in about our timing. Do we have time for a few questions today? Okay, great. So I'd like to, um, I do have a few more slides there to wrap things up. I don't know if that's able to come up. Yeah, there toward the end. We might zip through my slides really quickly. It's going to be very exciting. Um, I want to take this uh, moment to um, uh, offer another acknowledgement that's really um, important to me, and that is uh, my daughter Rita is here today. She's over there. Um, <laughs> Rita was born in uh, 2010, which was, um, according to, the, to our statistics, the year of the um, highest uh, maternal mortality rates in, in recent years. And um, so it's, you know, going along this journey has been really important to me. And, and I'm um, grateful to um, all of my panelists here for what they've shared and grateful to all of us that bring our whole selves into this work. The data that we've seen today show us that maternal health is in crisis in communities across the United States. It's a local problem, it's a global problem. We have profound racial inequities. I wanna correct my slide up there. It says disparities, and I think we need to go further than calling difference and talk about inequities when, there, when um, that's what we see. There's unequal access to care, and there's variability across regions, states, counties, and communities. And there's a lot more we can do. That's why we're all here today. I'm gonna skip that. I also wanna come back to this point. We are talking a lot about maternal mortality and maternal morbidity, but it is not just about how mothers die, but how rural women live and access care in rural America. We need to hold ourselves to a higher standard in maternity care than did you die or did you not die. We can do better than that. And we can see communities, yeah. <laughs> 
where where maternity care is flourishing and where every birth is is a uh, well supported um, and safe one. So some of the key questions that I want to highlight and bring up from today's discussion, I want to encourage you all to discuss in your own questions, um, and please feel free to start to gather the microphones if you do have questions that you would like to ask. But I want to think about how did the data that we saw today illuminate particular clinical and structural facets of maternal health in rural areas? Healthcare access and um, health across the lifespan, not just at the time of pregnancy or childbirth, but all the times before um, pregnancy, early in life during adolescence and um, during the postpartum period. And thinking about taking health equity work outside of urban centers and into rural communities and thinking about health equity in, in places across America. What don't we know that we need to know and what are the policy changes that we can adopt to um, improve some of these issues. So with that, I'm going to um, welcome any, any other questions that, that folks have. And um, thank you all for your contributions and for being here. So please go ahead. Hi, good morning. Thank you for uh, the conversation. I'm Jermaine Bond from the National Quality Forum. And I wonder, given that we're talking about framing maternal health, what role do men and fathers play in this um, this concept. Great. Was that a question for a specific panelist, or would um, you like? I'd like to pose the question for the day. Certainly. Um, but let's start now. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you very much. And I also appreciate uh, we we had a really good demonstration here of a of a short introduction and a question that begins with a question word and ends in a question mark and is 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 short. So thank you for demonstrating that. I appreciate it. And now let's turn to that really important topic. I welcome um, input from our panelists. So uh, that's a great question about what is the role that uh, men and fathers have in uh, maternal health. We're trying to identify some of that by looking at a project called Prams for Dads, where we're um, asking about some of these questions. We do know that father involvement uh, reduces the risk for adverse fa outcomes for moms as well as for dads. They participate in less risky behavior. They improve their health outcomes. So I think the, to the degree that we can have them engaged in this is important. And as you know, through many of the stories that have been told, we've heard those stories from fathers in terms of, uh, in terms of maternal mortality and severe maternal morbidity. So absolutely, they have a very important role to play. Any other panelists like to speak to that? Sure. Um, I just want to, I mean, I agree that fathers have a critically important role. Women need to be supported. They need to be supported by their partners, by their families, their friends. It, as you know, we heard today, it takes a village, and it's really important. And to the extent that their partners can be educated and know how to support them and the types of services they need is always going to make their outcomes and care better. And since I'm standing in front of a microphone, I just want to say as well, this is yeah. an issue that affects all of us. And the men and fathers that lose people that they love in their lives, that lose mothers, that lose sisters, it is, it is about all of us and it takes all of us. And we need to make sure that our language includes men and that our programs include men and that men are, are thank you to all the men that are here today. We, we love having you here and, and being a part of this conversation because it's a conversation that affects families and communities and that includes all of us. Thank you for your question. Thank you. Next question, please. Good morning. Thank you all. My name is Laura Stokes. I work for Pacify, which is a maternal telemedicine company. Um, I have a question for Dr. Barfield, and I'm a former CDC employee, so thank you so much for your service. You. Um, but uh, I wanted to know what your opinions are on telemedicine and telehealth, especially in the wake of Dr. Hung's data around just the complete lack of access. How, um, at the federal level, are we thinking about incorporating telemedicine into our federal programs? So. Um, I think that telehealth is really an important area. There are a lot of things that we could do systematically to improve health in rural populations. And I think the points that were brought up earlier, just that I want to highlight, is that, you know, the hospital closures are occurring and that, that may not necessarily be such a bad thing. Because we know that volume and experience saves lives. So we don't want to have the reaction that, oh, we need to reopen facilities, but we do need to think about solutions, and one of them is rural health. We've done a systematic review by state to look at uh, the rural health 
uh, with regard to telemedicine policies, and they're very thin. They're we're just it's it's interesting because I also work in the global arena and it seems like telehealth is really taking off there mm -hmm. um, and not just in developed countries but in developing countries and I think the bottom line is where's the reimbursement mm -hmm. because there there are also other factors that we can improve with regard to transport for example I've had discussions with the health department in Alabama and where you're born is where you are. And in terms of getting that transport resource, it, it's very limited. So I think as we think about telehealth as an opportunity, we need to think about how we're going to support it, how we're going to pay for it, what are the resources that are available to, to make it a good system. We're also seeing it in other areas of adult medicine. So we have an opportunity to think about it in maternal child health. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thank you. And how many more questions do we have time for? I know we're, we have two or three more questions. Okay, great. Well, we'll go back here and then we'll come up to the front, okay? And so everyone who is standing gets to ask their question. There we go. Good for you. Great. Thanks, Katie. My name is Alan Morgan. I'm CEO of the National Rural Health Association. And oftentimes I do hear the statement, well, these, mater these rural hospitals and these maternity centers in rural communities, they should close. But can you address the fact that the majority of these are happening in communities of color? So what is that, what is that message? Um, how do you, do you feel comfortable saying with the majority of these happening in communities of color that they should close? So I'm not saying that they should close. I'm just saying that closing isn't necessarily a bad thing. So we know that What's needed in terms of the delivery of quality care is appropriate people as well as appropriate uh, equipment and resources. And it's, it is an issue also in urban settings in terms of, you know, making sure that you have risk-appropriate settings. And, and that's the most important part. The question is, what are the solutions to these issues that are closing? You know, it, it would be a problem if you don't have an appropriate blood bank for an for a issue related to trauma or those resources, we want to look at other opportunities to get women where they need to be. So I, I think that this is a, in no way um, sort of a, a negative reflection on rural areas. We just have to think about different solutions and, you know, what are the resources that we need to identify in terms of, one, identifying women at risk, two, thinking about plans, having preactive communication. So we do it, for example, in emergency preparedness, right, where, ha we ha where we're trying to have pre-existing agreements between facilities so that just in case something happens, we know where we can send high-risk patients. We need to do the same thing for maternal health care so that a, a family physician or a provider actually is aware of the resources that are available around them just in case. And the other thing that was alluded to earlier is how can we also have interstate agreements, particularly among frontier states, so that they can work together to think about these issues in terms of planning. Thank you. And I just want to um, answer that, that question very briefly again to say in some data that we did not bring to bear here today, but research that I've led looking at the effects of loss of hospital-based obstetric services in rural communities, we found that they were different for rural counties that are adjacent to urban areas and those that were not adjacent. Yeah. In rural counties that are not adjacent to urban areas, we found higher rates of preterm birth after loss of hospital-based obstetric services, and those are the type of real effects as the, you know, it's the strongest predictor of infant mortality, which we know is higher in rural communities. So knowing that now helps plan for what needs to happen, and it also gives us a, a sense of the magnitude of the complications. Preterm birth is also more frequent among uh, black mothers, and those are also the communities that are losing services more frequently. So these are tied together, and I appreciate your elevating that, Alan. Thank you. My name's Steve Foley, and I, I'm uh, OB, and I work 120 miles from the closest Starbucks. So uh, if that's any, I don't know if that's a, you You're know, really that's a statistic it's that you can look at. But. We've, we've talked about how far you are from a target. Yes, there's a lot of ways yeah. to measure rural. Right. <laughs> Thank and you. And you, uh, you just addressed my question. Um, I'm 30 miles from Kansas in Colorado, mm -hmm. and you know people drive an hour and a half to see me when there's a, a facility you know, 30 minutes from them in Kansas, but they have Medicaid in that 
you know, so, you know, how much is that being addressed? And I also, I think it'd be interesting to look at statistically, what is the father or family support based on, um, you know, ethnicity too? Is it, does it change, you know, with, with different ethnic groups or is it pretty consistent? I think that would be an interesting thing to, to look at or I doubt if there's an answer, but if there is, that'd be great. I think we need to have more information. I think the other thing that we have to think about in terms of, um, you know, partnering and parenting is how do we define it often within a healthcare system. I I know that as a as a newborn medicine physician, there are times when fathers may not appear to be as welcomed in the NICU because of what is perceived as a legal partnership. So I think we need to look at those those issues as well. Hi, I'm Elaine Heisler from the Congressional Research Service. I'm wondering if there's any information about non-hospital births in rural areas, either those that are planned or unplanned. So um, we know that just about 2% of births happen outside of facilities, and um, we know that they do occur in, you know, at higher rates among non-Hispanic white women, what we don't know is if those births are planned or unplanned. Um, we do have, and then the other issue that we're really trying to understand is we know that about 15% of those births are higher risk, meaning they're um, more than a single ten preterm, um, and there are components that, so you wonder if they're really planned or if they are planned what do women understand about um, non-facility deliveries that we need to better educate them on? And just to speak to that point very briefly, again, in the same study um, that we did looking at loss of hospital-based obstetric services, we found that in rural counties, that was associated with an increase in yeah. out-of-hospital births. Yeah. And again, we could not distinguish whether those were planned or unplanned um, out-of-hospital births, uh, and they could also be births along the way to a hospital. Um, in addition, we found an increase in births in hospitals that don't have obstetric units, So, which is another... Um, you know, that's still within a facility, but that's a different uh, type of circumstance. And that jump was, again, higher in the rural communities that are not adjacent to urban areas. I think we have, do we have time for one more um, question from the internet or from some, I don't know, but I got this card. The internet. Okay. <laughs> um, so thank you, people out there watching online and asking questions. Um, in seeking multiple solutions for um, what role do you see for rurally located graduate medical education oh. and um, residency training in rural communities and family medicine, OBGYN, general surgery, to prepare a physician workforce more appropriately for caring uh, for maternity care in rural places? Yeah. And I know this is going to be a good segue to our next panel, yeah. but if there are any thoughts here um, before, before we move on. Um. So I do think that this is an opportunity for the next set of panelists to talk a bit about. But I think, you know, in my introduction, the point that I was trying to make is that we may need to think about how um, physicians who are in rural areas are being trained differently. You know, for again, when I was in the Army, I would say, well, to these pediatricians, where are you going to be assigned? And if they were going to be assigned in a more rural area, we would talk about what are you going to do when you're the only one, you're it. You know, how are you, what are going to be your resources? How are you going to su support the mom, you know, aunt, or the baby when help is on the way but not there yet? So um, I think that that's an important issue, and I think we're going to hear more about it from our other panelists. This is such a lovely transition. You all, we, we did that magically and beautifully. And I thank you all in this room for your participation. Um, I believe we are going to take a, sh oh, Dr. Kara James is going to tell us what we're going to do next. <laughs> thank you all very much for, thanks to our panelists. Thank you, Katie, and thank you uh, to the panelists. This was great. Um, that was a fair bit of data, so I know everybody's brain needs a little bit of a moment to process that. Um, we do want to encourage the chats that are happening again on Twitter. There is coffee and refreshments out there, and we are grateful to our partners at ACOG for providing that. So thank them for the, the caffeination to help process the data, and we will reconvene in 10 minutes. I know the program says 15, but we're going to do 10 so that we can get uh, moving with the next session. Thank you.